Let's just pray together. Father, we thank you for the privilege of looking at your word this morning. And I pray, oh God, that you would open the eyes of our hearts and our minds that we might be able to comprehend you more fully. That we might understand your word, that we might be able to align ourselves with your will. But Lord, also we know that your word is intended to sanctify us as well. So I pray that as a result of this, we might become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. We dedicate this teaching time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Several years ago, when we lived in Placerville, California, something took place that was clearly the biggest social event of the year. It was the public unveiling of local artist Thomas Kincaid's latest painting entitled Placerville in the Snow. This was long before Kincaid had made a name for himself. He was still kind of a local boy uh, doing well. But the painting was displayed in a room bursting with people and buzzing with excitement. Outside in the rain, hundreds more stood in line, waiting to feast their eyes on this highly anticipated work of art. And actually, there was a little more to it than that. In fact, I think for most people, seeing the original painting was of secondary interest. What they really wanted was an opportunity to purchase a print of this new masterpiece. And indeed, they were snatching them up two, three, four at a time for $35 a piece. Now, you are aware, I'm sure, that a print is not technically a work of art. It is a glorified poster, mass-produced in a high-tech print shop without the direct intervention of the artist. And although these particular prints were expertly manufactured, they were nothing compared to the original. They lacked the luster, the vividness, the texture, and the subtleties that could only be seen in the original painting. So why all the excitement? Why the masses of people willing to stand in line for more than two hours? Because inside the room, behind a table, sat Thomas Kincaid. In in front of him were stacks of prints, and he was signing them one after another just as fast as he could. And that is what most people were after on this night. That is why they were willing to wait in the rain. That is why they were so excited. You see, When that mass-produced print came into direct contact with the artist's pencil, its worth was raised dramatically. Suddenly, that poster, which cost but a few dollars to print, became worth quite a bit. At the time, prints of his first painting of Placerville were worth $500, that is, if they had his signature on them. His signature was what gave them their worth because that was the direct connection between the poster and the painter. I'm not entirely sure about this, but I've heard it estimated that on a purely material basis, the total mineral value of your body It's about a dollar and a half. Give or take a few cents, depending on your size and, uh, of course, whether you've got gold in your teeth. But it is an astounding thought to think that the dollar value of this ring on my finger is a hundred times that of my entire body. Thousands of times that of the finger on which it rests. And yet, I would not swap this finger for all the rings in the world. Look at the incredible detail in this thing, the 
the, the, the lines, the flexibility, the, the folds, the patterns. There's not another finger like this on the face of the earth. Look at how versatile it is. Look at how useful it is. Why, the finger is amazing. Then I look at my hand to which this finger is attached, all the things that my hand can do, and then I consider my arm and its flexibility and its motion and strength, and, and then my shoulder and on and on. Have you ever stopped? and seriously pondered the wonderful intricacies and astonishing nuances of your physical being. From the 26 tiny bones on your feet to the thousands of hairs on your head, you possess one fascinating feature after another. You are nothing short of a wonder. And valuable? Ah, as theists, we believe in a creator. As Christians, we believe that that creator is personal. That is, he wasn't merely standing by or even supervising the creation of us and our bodies. No, he's the potter, we're the clay. He's the artist, we're the canvas. He used his creative genius to carefully and lovingly fashion every design and detail of our beings. We are not mass-produced reproductions. We are not facsimiles that merely have his stamp or even his signature on them. We are original works of art from the Creator himself, we are masterpieces. We are the glory of God's gallery. Do you believe that? I hope you do. But if you don't, I pray that God will convince you of this as we study this portion of Psalm 139 and that he will also show you the tremendous implications of the value he places on human life. Look at verse 13 of Psalm 139. For you, O God, formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows this full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. I stop there and say that David, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uses the words knitted and woven to describe how we are put together by God. Did you know that shortly after the first microscopes were invented, the earliest researchers began examining body tissues? They discovered that under magnification, our bodies look as though they have been knit or woven together. Our skin, for example, is made of collagen fibers that look like miniature pieces of rebar. And these fibers are actually stronger and less elastic than steel. And yet one of the most notable, remarkable features of our skin is its elasticity. How do you explain that? It's because those incredibly strong collagen fibers are knit and woven together so that they can be stretched. That's God's design. By the way, he did the knitting. And talk about complex. Science can explain a lot of things. For example, science tells us that a human being is conceived when the single cell of a female is fertilized by the single cell of a male. 
We know that those cells divide multiple times so that by the time a baby enters the world, he or she is made up of 100 trillion cells, each of which coordinate and cooperate with each other so that the body can move and see and hear and perform countless other functions. We know that, the, that within each cell there is a genetic code so complete that the entire body could be reassembled by the information in that one single cell. We also know something about a chemically coiled strand inside each cell's nucleus called DNA, which gives instructions to each cell. It is estimated that if these instructions were written out, they would fill 1,600-page volumes. We know that DNA is so narrow and so compacted that all, my, all the genes in my body's cell would fit into an ice cube. And yet if that DNA were unwound and stretched uh, end to end, the strand could stretch from the earth to the sun and back again 400 times. That's what science knows. And that's impressive. But what science can only conjecture is how that DNA got there. Where it got its instructions. How each cell knows what to do and where to go. You've heard many scientists say that man just evolved from a chance collision of atoms to become a very complex blob of protoplasm. That makes about as much sense as me telling you that Thomas Kincaid's paintings are the result of an explosion in a paint store. It's absurd. How could something so intricate and precise and complex be accidental? I'm not ashamed to say that I'm the work of a personal, purposeful, intelligent creator. I think it takes far greater faith to believe in evolution than it does to believe in God. You've got to do some serious denial to believe in evolution. The psalmist says in an attitude of wonder, you formed my inward parts. Literally, you created or formed my kidneys. Kidneys were believed to be the center of one's emotions and moral sensibilities. And so this is a reference to what we call personality. God was not only the genetic engineer of our bodies, but he gave each of us designer kidneys. That is, a personality that was tailored and designed for each of us alone. Our demeanor, our sense of humor, our preferences, our IQ, they've all been specially designed to make us what we are. That is what the second line of verse 13 says. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. And then verse, 13, verse 15. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. God is such a good artist that he designed us and put us together in the dark. Secret and depths of the earth are metaphorical references to the mother's womb. It is there that God's creative power and genius are employed so beautifully. We know that after just seven weeks in the womb, a fetus has essentially all of its parts formed. God did that. And if God did that, it makes that fetus precious because it is the work of his hands. 
It is an affront to God to say that fetus has no worth, that fetus has no rights, that it can be destroyed and disposed of if the mother doesn't want to go through with the pregnancy. No. That fetus is a human being that has been uniquely and exquisitely woven together by the creator himself and it is his masterpiece a one of a kind the glory of his gallery i'd like you to think for a moment of some of the most valuable works of art that have ever been created For example, think of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel that Michelangelo painted. For for five years, he laid on his back 60 feet above the ground, covering 10,000 square feet, painstaking, brilliant, invaluable. What would the reaction be If someone who didn't like that art, who was somehow offended by his depictions of Bible scenes, broke into the Sistine Chapel one night and and blew it up, destroying it completely. Why? There would be a great outcry from all over the world. It would be front page headlines. There would be memorials and speeches and television specials decrying this malicious act of terror. And yet, as tragic as that would be, it doesn't compare to the tragedy of attacking and destroying human life. Any human life. That fetus that person who has an incurable disease, that elderly person who is barely hanging on to life is God's masterpiece. And we should view and treat him or her as such. Far more precious than anything man has ever devised or created. What does the knowledge that God is the personal creator of life do to you? It ought to make you blurt out with David, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. When we take time to reflect upon the various details of our bodies and the intricacies of our personalities, It ought to point us to the one who designed and created us and compel us to praise him. And believe me, the more we know, the more we would be compelled to worship. Did you know, for example, that in your eye there are 107 million cells that send millions of messages to your brain simultaneously? Simultaneously? Did you know that your eye is capable of distinguishing 1,000 shades of color? Did you know that inside your ear is a drum that moves when sound frequencies pass through it? And that when you hear a note on the piano, middle C, for example... Your eardrum vibrates 256 times per second. And so sensitive is that drum that on the slightest of sounds, it will flutter one billionth of a centimeter. That seems impossible to calibrate. And yet that's how intricate God made you. What does that knowledge do to you? It ought to compel us to blurt out, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. But 
knowledge of who we are not only compels us to worship, it affects our values and our relationships with other people. Why is there so much violence and abuse in our world? Why is there prejudice, strife, sexual perversion, hatred, abortion, euthanasia, and a host of other social ills that are endemic in our society. I don't want to be overly simplistic, but certainly one of the primary factors is that there was a blatant disregard for the value and the sanctity of human life. People are viewed as objects to be used, foes to be conquered, animals with which to experiment, enemies to be subjugated, even destroyed. Life is cheap. Life is dispensable. In some societies, it's every man for himself, survival of the fittest, dog eat dog. That view of life one of the greatest problems in the world today, and it has tremendous implications. What would we do if we truly believed that mankind was the glory of God's gallery? I believe there would be a lot more people who had Mother Teresa's perspective about human life. She would search the gutters and garbage piles of Calcutta's alleys where she would find dying people. She would bring them to her hospital where she and the Sisters of Charity would surround them with love, daubing at their sores, cleaning off layers of grime, swaddling them in soft sheets. And she was asked, Numerous times why she did this. Why expend limited resources on people for whom there is little hope? Most of these patients died in a matter of days or weeks. Why not give attention to people who could be re rehabilitated? People who could eventually make a contribution to society? Her response? Because when I look into their eyes, I see Jesus. When we look at another human being, we ought to be able to see in that person something of the image of God. We ought to be able to see our Creator's personal design. And that alone ought to compel us to treat that person, any person, with the dignity they deserve. Dignity bestowed not on the basis of one's achievements or appearance or status or race or likability or any other worldly value, but totally on the basis of the worth they have as God's specially designed creation, a masterpiece, the glory of his gallery. If we really believe what the psalmist is saying here in this passage, it would make a huge difference in how we treat people. If we viewed people as persons made by God in his image, we'd be much less inclined to put them down, make fun of them, gossip, criticize, judge, exploit, manipulate, be irritated, or be indifferent, we would be much more inclined to listen, to sympathize and empathize, to be considerate, kind, compassionate, interested, treating them as we ourselves want to be treated. 
We would devote more of our time to people and invest in them and less of our time in projects and activities that benefit no one but ourselves. In short, people would become our greatest priority next to God himself. What's more, if we believed that all people are created by him and for him, then we would treat all people with dignity. Not just the ones who have the same color of skin as us, or the same religion, or the same political persuasion, or the same values, but all people. Not just the ones who are attractive and winsome and important in the world's eyes, but those whom the society deems unimportant and unlovely. Those that society calls lowlife or losers. For any of us to be partial or prejudiced is an affront to Almighty God who created all people with equal dignity and honor. In God's sight, there's no such thing as ugly, no such thing as insignificant, no such thing as a biological mistake. He cre created all for his glory and honor, and all reflect that glory and honor, whether it is readily apparent or not. My wife Mindy used to teach her first graders a song that has a line in it that goes like this. God just doesn't make junk. That's really good theology. What we call physical and mental defects or deformities are not accidental. They are purposeful. God has designed that person in some way to reflect his glory. But there's something else. If we really believed that each person is God's personal masterpiece, it would have tremendous implications on how we view ourselves. Have you ever thought to yourself, if only I was prettier, smarter, a different size or shape. If only I had different features. If only I had a higher IQ or a better memory or a more dynamic personality. Are you content with the way God made you? Or do you wish you could be different? we really believe what this psalm says, it ought to bring our complaints about ourselves to a grinding halt. It ought to foster contentment and joy and satisfaction and wonder. It, it ought to deter us from comparing ourselves with others or measuring ourselves by some arbitrary standard of beauty trying to be someone we're not. I remember years ago watching a feature on a news magazine that showed a lady whose supreme ambition in life was to look like a Barbie doll. She spent over $500 thousand dollars on procedures and plastic surgeries with a Barbie doll as a model. And you know what? She looked like a Barbie doll. I, I'm not even going to attempt to analyze why people try to look and be different than what they were created to be, but whether they realize it or not, they are tampering with God's masterpiece. They are saying, in effect, God, you didn't do a very good job with me. I, I, I wish I was something different. I'm not saying, by the way, that we shouldn't try to look our best or that we shouldn't stay in good physical condition or that there's no place for self-improvement. 
knowing that we are the glory of God's gallery, ought to compel us to take good care of our bodies and, and our minds, to live up to our potential. What I'm saying is that we ought to be and we can be perfectly secure and content and satisfied with the way God made us because each of us is a specially designed masterpiece, a one of a kind, the glory of his gallery. God is sovereign. He is the one who determines what we are like. He's the one who designs our bodies, our personalities, our capabilities. But there's one other thing that this passage says. Look at verse 16. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. This means before we were even born, when we were just fetuses that were not fully formed, God knew exactly how long we would live. I, I think it's a stretch to interpret this verse as the New American Standards uh, interprets it, that God determines how long we live on this earth. The New American Standard translates it, the days that were ordained for me. Ordained seems like determine. That Hebrew word has never meant ordained any other time it's used in Scripture. It means form. David is simply telling us that God knows how long we are going to live. So he knows all about the babies that have been miscarried in their mother's womb. He knows about the choice that a mother might make to abort her baby. But even though he knows that these children will not live to see the light of day on this earth, he still lovingly and carefully fashions each of them in their mother's wombs and puts every bit as much of effort in designing and forming their personalities. You know why? Because they are eternal souls. And they will live forever in the presence of Jesus. Likewise, God knows how many days you and I will live on this earth. And he's known it since before we were born. And that means that nothing takes him by surprise. He knows all about accidents and diseases that, from our perspective, shorten life. And he knows all about medicines and technologies that, from our perspective, lengthen life. The point David wants to make in this verse is that God is personal. His knowledge of us is intimate. Jesus said that God knows exactly the number of hairs on our heads. Remember, he's the potter, we're the clay. He's the creator and the designer of every single person. But he is also the God who is in the business of recreating and restoring our lives, providing opportunity for us to become everything that he intended us to be. And so God didn't just form us in the womb so that we could live out our days on this earth and then die at a ripe old age. No, he created us so that we could know him, have intimate fellowship with him, and live with him forever. And we are able to do that when we allow him 
to restore his image in us. Most of you are aware that while we are created in God's image, sin, beginning with Adam and Eve's sin, severely distorted and marred that image in us. But God sent his son, Jesus Christ, into this world to restore that image. And that is precisely what happens when we receive Jesus Christ into our lives. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. When we receive Jesus, we become new creations and we are able to become then what God intended us to be. And we receive this gift and this opportunity when we put our faith in Jesus. Because remember, he's not just a personal creator. He didn't just personally create you and design you uniquely, lovingly, carefully. He created us to have a personal relationship with him. And that comes through Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let's pray together, shall we? Father in heaven, thank you so much for the opportunity to have your word that clearly spells out how personal, how loving, how gracious and kind you are and have been to every one of us. Thank you for the provision that you made to have a relationship with you through Jesus. Lord, it is my prayer that if there are any people here today that don't know him yet, that have not put their trust in him, that you would open their eyes, spiritual eyes, to see Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We thank you in his name. Amen.